on a hill near a wood where nobody goes up a track through a gate the food forest grows with secrets and treasures for everyone's pleasure and rose discover rose discovery January the 14th, the optimum time this month to sow above ground annuals, according to the lunar gardening calendar. But as usual, I'm working by my own schedule, doing entirely the wrong thing and harvesting root crops three months too late. These should have been red and golden ochre tubers, Oxalix tuberosa. I was expecting a whole crateful from this fertile six by six foot patch, as was the case last year. But because I've left it far too late, the frequent frost has frozen their skins and they've all rotted, all but four. But with care, four ochre tubers will be just enough to replant this spring, so that this valuable, locally adapted strain doesn't die out. However, the mashua or air potato vine, Tropiolum tuberosum, planted as a secondary crop and the perfect companion to the ochre, has done fantastically and survived the sub-zero temperatures. Look at all those firm and moist, tasty tubers. Mashed mashua will very much be on the menu this month. The rain has just stopped. Silence. Damp clothes drying out. Lovely. Red velvet cake. Book of tea. Cheers. Obligatory. Monkey Island coaster. <laughs> Spontaneous video, apparently. There you go, chick chicks. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh dear. Oh, the wind caught the door, you poor thing. Come back, have your oats. Come on, come on, come on. Where are you, licorice? Oh, look, the two new duckies are out. Ah, oh, can you see them? There they are. Oh, bless them, look at them. Their first time out of the palace. They're a bit wary of those geese. Understandably so, bullies. Here's chamomile and licorice. Two silky silkies. I just realized this is my first ever video in portrait. stopped. First time in about 24 hours. It really is a quad mark. Hey, 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 hey. I'm splattered in mud now. Rob's face is very dirty because one of the geese was just attacking one of the new ducks the first time it stepped foot outside of Duckingham Palace and the two geese were pulling its wings apart. So I had to tackle a goose to the ground and it flapped its wings as it would, and splash mud in my face. So, uh, yeah, muddy. Oh! And there's the wind blowing the door closed. It nearly trapped another chicken. <laughs> charge, well three batteries, 
because tomorrow being Thursday, I've been invited to uh, a copse or coppice, depending where you're from. It's a, a 20 acre woodland that is managed by my friend Mike, who was in that hedge laying video. He's also a hedge layer, but he's now taken over this copse and he's going to teach me all about managing a sustainable woodland. So I'm going there all day from dawn till dusk tomorrow to make a film about that. Seeing as you're here, let's see what's going on in the garden. Pulmonary is looking colourful. Pulmonary area. Duckies having a rest from their slug hunting duty. Hello chick chicks. I'm not giving any more oats to you. You've had a whole handful today. There was a lot of high winds last weekend. There was lots of storm damage. I lost all my solar panels. I came back on the Sunday morning to find all the panels on the different structures missing and just the bare wires flailing in the wind. But I did find all the panels and none of them were cracked and they are now all installed back on the roof a little bit more securely tethered than before. So I soldered them all back on and I have electric again. And the garden, the forest garden itself, was absolutely fine apart from all my plant labels have blown over flat. So I went round putting them back up. The yurt has been super cosy this winter time. The fire has been going non-stop since November. I've not let it go out. Oh, to put my Wellington boots on, really. I'm just squelching through this quadmire in my crocs. Hello, duckies. Anyway, three weeks ago when I turned up to work there on a Tuesday, she had these two ducks for me. Uh, they are £15 each, and I really wanted to hatch out some more this year under the broody chickens. But anyway, here they are. They are that one and that one, the slightly darker brown ones. And they're not quite a year old yet, but they've integrated with the other ducks very well. And they formed a, a posse with the four ducklings from last year that that chicken hatched out. And they are super intelligent ducks, having been, been brought up by a chicken and having to negotiate geese every day. Hello. The garden is looking quite bleak and windswept, though, there are signs of life. Well, now that's the beginning of March. It's beginning to look spring-like. Lots and lots of rain here. Lots and lots of rain. Scrub, scrub, scrub. Look, daffodils. Strangers. It'll definitely be rhubarb time again soon. There's gonna be a, a super crop this year. Probably thanks to all the pony poo I've been piling on it. I don't know if you can see, but the frogs have been at it again. And there is a lovely load of frog spawn. That was laid about three or four days ago. You can tell the tadpoles are developing well in their gelatinous eggs. And as for the dome, well, it has been almost exactly a year since the idea was first had and 11 months since its construction. It's been exposed to the elements, but it's in position. And look, on the weekend, I finally finished digging the trench all the way around the outside. So now I've got to work out how to get the, the plastic over it. That'll be a job for the next Calm, dry day. Oh, some rogue garlic. Forgot about that. Four colonies of super strong honeybees at the moment that were out two days ago when it was last sunny. And they were nectaring on all these catkins from the willow and hazel. Look at that Italian red alder, all those catkins. That's what a watercress bed looks like when you don't put fencing around it. And that's when you do. Look, watercress.
also when you grow your own food you feel a lot more confident in yourself you feel more secure I suppose because of having food security and it's a lot easier to say no in case anyone asks you to do anything you don't want to do I don't like being told what to do if it's unreasonable and having my own food supply well and firewood supply and water and all the things I need has made me a lot more confident over the last 10 years despite how it must seem on camera sometimes but that's a different matter <laughs> Hello. Hey. That's unusual for you to be picking wildflowers. Mm. Primroses. Hello. Primroses, but I thought you'd be really interested to know this. Did you know that there are male primroses and female primroses? And the way you tell the difference is male has got a circle in the middle where the pollen is made and the female has a different centre which will ultimately become the seeds. Can you see the sort of seeds to be? You know, I've never known that. I've always wondered what the difference is. So if you ever had to pick a primrose, and not that you've got to, always what take the male. And what would be the reason to pick a primrose apart from putting it in a salad to look pretty? Well... Making you... posies, selling them door to door, like your mum used to do? <laughs> well, I wouldn't condone that for a moment because I think they look much better in the hedgerows so you left where they are. I just wanted to show you that because, yeah, because it's not many people know that. I so didn't know that either. Thank you very much. If you ever do need to pick up primrose, make sure you take the males because there's a millions of pollens compared to the amount of seed you might collect from the female. Okay. What a perfect lesson. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Very rude to be on with sunglasses and quietly. Very rude. Wow. Anyway. You know what your eyes are like. Um, <laughs> okay. Thank you for that. See you a little later. See you soon. Enjoy the sunshine. Bye. Bye. Hello. It's the first day since last September that I've actually been able to take my coat off and just wear my jumper. Hello, duckies. I'm just walking through. No need to move. Look. It's like a little igloo, isn't it? just finished cutting off the surplus plastic from round the outside. There's enough to make a whole other polytunnel there. Well, not quite. It was estimated very well, the 14 square metre sheet, to go over this five and a half metre diameter dome. I'm just backfilling it with soil now to keep the weight down there. In we go. Hot, hot, hot. All the trees that have been exposed to the elements over the last year since I took the last greenhouse down are now actually coming back to life. I don't think there'll be a crop this year. But look, peach blossom. And the grapevines are coming back to life, albeit a little later than expected. The two lemon trees have survived. I've missed a whole years worth of lemons but that's fine the trees are alive and hopefully this coming winter time I'll have another 200 lemons per tree like last year and then I can make some more disastrous lemon curd hello it's the end of March now I'm just digging up this earth chestnut or groundnut to see if it's made it through the winter I thought it might have spread into the surrounding area that these rotivating chickens have scratched this up so much that only the original plant is here. And there's a cunning weed, I don't know what it is, but it looks very, very similar to the leaves of this groundnut here. So I'm just trying to weed it out. And I put this cage over the top to stop the chickens scratching it up because it, it did go to seed and the seeds spread, but I don't know where they are. Actually, I don't even know if it spreads with seeds or with tubers, probably both. But I've just lifted up the original plant that I planted last year. And look, I don't, I suppose you can't get closer because of the cage, but, but these are the actual edible little tubers so beloved by pigs, hence the name pignut. 
and they're like peanuts actually they're not really nuts they're like legumous things but they're very very tasty so perhaps i will rip this in two and divide it now that it's got the cage over it and then it will spread throughout the year but the easiest way of growing groundnuts well it's the only way i know really well apart from tiger nuts that's a different story Hello, it's 8 o'clock in the evening on the 4th of April, it's a Monday, I've been working all day, but since I got back from work this evening, I've spent the last couple of hours finishing off the last bits of strimming the meadow areas of the forest garden. A gentle rain has just begun to fall, there's a beautiful light in the air, and it's quite clear to see now which areas of the forest garden are meadow and which are forest garden. Well, this is like the, uh, the south end, the more traditional garden with little vegetable beds and fruiting bushes and shrubs in the greenhouse. I've recently planted lots of hazel cuttings all down here. This is going to be a, a hazel hedge dividing the south garden from the forest garden over here. But all around the outside of the forest garden in a big ring is about an acre's worth of meadow areas that I've just had to strim. Well I, I meant to side that last year but I seldom do, seldom get round to it. And I go on about meadows a lot but I had to do that because there are no grazing animals so I've artificially grazed it. Well I use Shetland ponies, they came up here quite a few days running but they didn't eat all the grass because I didn't bring them up here early enough in the winter, so I've had to finish it off with the strimmer. April the 19th. Rhubarb, watercress and duck eggs. But what to do with today's garden harvest? Boil them, mash them, stick them in a stew? Fortunately, 
I had lots of comments with brilliant suggestions. Poached eggs with watercress, rhubarb with duck egg custard, with the rhubarb and eggs, a cake. The watercress will be a great salad or smoothie. Egg and watercress sandwiches and a wonderful rhubarb crumble, yum yum. Omelette with a raw watercress and rhubarb salad. Honkers get stuck. She squeezed into the duck enclosure to cause havoc where she knew she shouldn't be. To say she's not the cleverest goose is being kind. She saw me approach and in her panic forgot where the entrance was and wedged herself against the mesh. Yes, I quickly rescued her, but not before snapping this embarrassed looking photograph. April the 21st. It's time to finally plant out the meagre root stash I've been harbouring from the frost in my shed since the beginning of last winter. There were quite a few more than this, but I ate some. An old wooden chest of drawers was the perfect place to store them, cool, dark and moist. Guess which ones I inadvertently left on the damp and sunny windowsill though. April the 24th. An electric refrigerator is a marvellous thing. However, having one in my kitchen yurt, though convenient to access, is painfully inefficient. The yurt is warm in the winter and hot in the summer, and poor little Friggy has to work full time to keep that produce cool. This takes a heavy toll on the yurt's solar charged battery, and I often have to choose between having electric lights for the evening or keeping the fridge on an extra hour. Now, thanks to some scrap timber offcuts and an old plastic feed sack and two hours of DIYing, I have a nifty little earth roofed fridge shack on the northern cool and shady side of the yurt. Look at that, a thriving colony of honeybees in an old national hive. Hello, it's the last day of April today, the 1st of May tomorrow, and at the beginning of the winter last year, there were four strong colonies of honeybees around the forest garden. We haven't really checked on them until now. I've had a look at the entrances and through the observation windows, and they all seemed to overwinter very well until last month when this was the only one where there was any activity as the weather warmed up and the other three i'm just having a little look now i'm i'm taking a risk of putting them up because that's not really what i do and this worry hive just here i spent the last hour opening it and despite there being loads of stores honey and wax comb on the inside that's the lid just there and the insulation there was no bee activity at all there are a few dead bees but no more than you'd usually find from an active hive so what I think happened I found the remnants of a mouse nest in there so I'm just sorting out all the comb now I'm taking a little for myself as I do every few years I'm cutting it into, well, like cut comb and putting it in in tubs. Those are old takeaway tubs, not mine. I would extract the honey and put it in jars, but it's a lot of work. And it's coming towards the swarmy season now, which is May, June, July. So I want to prepare all the nine vacant hives on site, all the different styles of hive to make them attractive to any any swarms of honeybees that may either come from that hive or from elsewhere. So I'm going to use all this old comb and honey. It's actually started to ferment now. When I picked it up, a mead-like substance dribbled from it. And so I'm going to use different chunks of this to put in the different hives, like this um, one of my log-style hives under there. I may leave it there or I may get it out. Did you hear that? Maybe it wasn't an abandoned mouse nest after all. I 
thought I just heard a mouse. I didn't see one though. I saw one mouse. Where? Um, yeah, so that's a little um, honeybee update. I actually made a, a full honeybee diary for last year, 2021, but I've not stitched it together, edited it, or uploaded it yet, so that's in the pipeline. But look, I wonder why they abandoned it. Hello, chicken. Goodness. I need to do something about that. They all gather together to stand on the pedal so that their combined weight opens it, whereas normally only a duck's weight would open it. Come on. Morning, girls. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. I don't know why the bees abandoned this hive. I thought they came through the winter well, but abandon it they did. There's not a single dead bee left inside, so they must have gone somewhere else. I thought I would leave most of their stores that they left for any more bees that might move in. But I've just taken a little tithe for myself. I just cut it out of the home with a bread knife. Go 
judging from what the bees were collecting last autumn time. It's May the 7th now, and most of this is their autumnal stores. There are about 44 different kinds of nectar in this honey, I estimate. So I'm effectively eating the forest garden in its purest form. The time now is 11 past 11 in the morning, funnily enough. I've not eaten yet today. I don't think I shall now. That is so very, very sweet. So sweet, so sweet, so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Duckies. Just need to sort your feeder out. I think there are rats stuck in it again. How many this time? Oh gosh, big ones. Hello rats, come on out you come. Come on you bumming things. Eh, one rat, one rat there. Two, three. Four, five. Oh, lost count. Oh, it's filthy in there now. Ugh. Another day living off grid. Another leech stuck in the water pump. Relying on that plucky little pump for the majority of my and the animal's water needs, I'm sure it inconvenienced the leech a lot more than it did me. But even so, it's still a mighty mystery as to how they managed to sucker past the maze of microfilters right through the pump's diaphragm and often end up plopping out of the taps. But with 32 brains, not to mention their 10 stomachs and 18 testicles, I'm sure it's no problem for them to outfox my faucets. Filling up the kettle for a cuppa throughout May and June is certainly not a task to be undertaken while still half asleep. Oh, not again. Come on then, squirrel. Whoa! <laughs> that was quite a jump. Where have you gone? Hello. Hello, what have you got there? Hello, little gosling. Do you see one? Come on, let's have a look. How many have you got under there? How are you doing? Hello. Two little goslings. Do I hear a third under there? I'll leave you alone for a minute. I'll check later. Well done there, girl. Was it yours? Or was it yours? <laughs> it's very much the swarmy season now, now that it's approaching mid-May, where there may be swarms of passing honeybees looking for a place to make a new home. Either swarms that my existing hives are sending out to multiply their numbers, or perhaps from other apiaries in the village, or maybe even wild honeybees from the woods, if there are any still. But to make the various hives around the forest garden attractive, I need to do something to, not lure isn't the right word, but yeah, to attract the scout bees. So I've got a box of old honeycomb here, some of which I've eaten, some of which I'm going to give back to the bees in different forms, but some of which I'm going to use as an attractant for the different hives. So this piece of honeycomb here will be perfect to go into my laundry basket. I don't know if I should or can climb the ladder with one hand. Oh, actually no hands, I'm holding honeycomb in one and my telephone in the other. That ought to be enough to make the bees think it's a, a great place to make a home. And hopefully within the month or before the swarmy season ends in July, 
there might be a colony of happy honeybees in this, well, makeshift skep. <laughs> Let's find out. There we go. But is it going to stay in there as I put this back into position? Or is it going to fall out? Yep. <laughs> as I thought. That's better. I've wedged it at the top now, which I should have done to begin with. And look, some bird has been using this as an overnight perch. What a good idea. Will it stay? <laughs> it will not. I have a horribly sticky hand and a horribly sticky telephone, but I've done it. There we go. <laughs> This hive had a thriving colony of honeybees in it until last week. It's May now. They moved in about a year ago and I haven't touched them or opened them up, but they came through the winter really well and were flying until last week. And then there was no activity at the entrance. The only activity now are these scavenging bees that are going in from the other hives here to rob or to borrow any of the honey that these bees left behind. Or they might be scout bees from a swarm that's looking to make a new home here. But scout bees normally come in pairs and you can see them go in and out of all the gaps measuring. And these bees aren't doing that, they're just going in, stuffing themselves and then taking it all back to their home. This is the insulation box. It's an old super I've stuffed with hay. Well, stuffed one with hay and one with socks. Uh, this is my sock graveyard. This is where they all end up because I'm using this old national hive as a worry. So I'm using the rotating box system where you take the top box off every year and then put it back underneath when it's been emptied. But I've not touched this for a year, so I don't know what to expect. The, um, look at all this propolis in the top. They've plugged up this mesh ventilation gap with propolis, the bee glue, really well. And they've really stuck this top down go. You see I did leave some frames in there that I had but I just left them to build wild comb from the crown board here and build wild comb they have done so. Look at that. That's really fresh new comb possibly from this year and it's interesting how I wanted them to build it this way because I had all the frames in that direction. They've chosen to build their comb perpendicular to where I had the frames, which is very interesting. And I can't really see what's going on here. Oh, it's gone a bit mouldy. They did have a lot of stores though, and you can see the little coloured pockets here where they collected pollen. And there's still a lot for the bees to rob, the foraging bees to rob in there. Look, look at that. I think the best thing to do is probably just clear out the spider's webs that are in there and then put it back together and then just just wait for another swarm to turn up. Although I'd like to give them a little extra incentive. So I've got my box of broken honeycomb here that I've taken from the other abandoned worry hive. I've been going around the garden just putting a little bit of this for temptation's sake in all the vacant hives to try and lure any scout bees in. Look, they must have found a way in. It hasn't got any honey in. Let's find a nice honey laden segment. That's got a bit of diseased, a bit of chalk brood on the edge. We don't want to put that in. Let's find a nice, a nice piece. Yeah, that's a good one. Let's, um, let's pump that inside. I'll just uh, pop it inside there. I've left all these empty frames in there to use it like a bit like a, a makeshift top bar hive. And then put it back together and let's, let's see what happens. The bees do like it down here in this wetland area. It's the reed bed system. Marshmallow, anyway, I'll get carried away. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.
if you liked ducky, you're going to love goosey. There are actually two goslings so far, but this one's the least camera shy. 29 days ago, I slipped four goose eggs under two broody bantams. After a month of bickering over who's sitting on whose eggs, the two hens, one already an experienced mother duck, jointly hatched out two healthy goslings. One gosling died shortly after hatching, and the other egg doesn't appear to be fertile. There was a confused moment when they wondered whoever the father could be, but then their mother hen instincts kicked in, and the new hybrid family of four are now all enjoying copious amounts of fresh kale and watercress, whilst the intrigued but unsuspecting adult geese look on through the safety mesh. Oh, she's got a piece. Oh, they both got a piece. Now the 19th of May, only four days later, and look! A strong swarm of honeybees. They weren't here this morning. They must have arrived within the last hour. Some of them have pollen in their pollen sacks on their legs. So they are definitely collecting and not robbing the honey that we put in there last week. What a pleasing sight and sound. Look at all that excitement. And look. The maintenance bees are going around, sealing up all the gaps created by me by taking it apart last week with propolis. Look, sealing up with their bee glue. The boxes of the hive, the wood, is literally the skin of the super organism that a colony of honeybees is. And any breaks or gaps in the skin means disease, predators and all sorts of nasties can get in and vital heat pheromones and bee ether can seep out. I just made up the phrase bee ether. Or did I? No, I think I read it in an article about the medicinal benefits of inhaling the atmosphere of a hive. Well, the bees have found it. Although, alas, no swarm of bees yet. Just robbing bees. But at least they know where it is, in case some of them tell the others and they decide to swarm here. Again, a pleasing sight. A laundry basket, skep, full of honeybees. Taking the honey.